My name is Dylan Perrin, and you are listening to episode number 51 of the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. If you're new to the podcast, then welcome. If you are a regular listener, then thanks for jumping back onto another episode. Thank you to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. If you're looking for universal rock backgrounds, maximum reptile enclosures, the list continues to go on. Definitely go give them a check, even if you're bored and you're at home doing quarantine and you want to look at some cool pictures of some equipment definitely go give them a check and reminder animals at home is a proud supporter of the amazon rainforest conservancy or arc so if you do want to support them i would love if you did you can find links all over my website as well as in the show notes and if you do end up buying an animals at home t-shirt or sweater five dollars does automatically get donated to them that goes to protecting sections of the peruvian amazon rainforest in the tambupada region On today's episode of the podcast, I am joined by a very special guest. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Sergio Balaguerra Reña, who is a conservation biologist out of Colombia. Sergio is a brilliant scientist who received his PhD from Texas Tech studying the population ecology of the American crocodile. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I just want to set the scene here before we hit play on this episode. In 1955, a very prolific zoologist by the name of Frederick Medem traveled to a very remote river called the Aproporis River or the Rio Aproporis in a very remote section of the Colombian wilderness. While he was on his expedition, he described a very unique looking species or what he thought at the time to be a subspecies of the spectacled caiman. This specific caiman had some strange jaw features, very long, elongated snout, as well as an interesting yellowish coloration. Unfortunately, soon after that, Colombia's political climate began to deteriorate. A war broke out between the Colombian government and FARC, which is the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. With guerrilla warfare rife through sections of the country, it became virtually impossible for researchers to make their way to the Rio Aproporis or the Aproporis River to study the specimens that Madame had originally described in his expedition. This created a 60-year gap in information in the scientific literature on this specific species. Fortunately, in 2016, a peace agreement was formed between the Colombian government and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, meaning that area was now open for people to travel safely. Of course, Sergio immediately took the opportunity to start planning an expedition to the Aproporis River to confirm Madame's original sightings. So in this episode of the podcast, Sergio walks us through the expedition, what they found, the type of animals they were looking at, the research that's being done. We discuss whether or not the Aproporis caiman is actually a subspecies of spectacled caiman or is it its own species or something else entirely. Very, very interesting conversation. And we also discuss the TV show Extinct or Alive with Forrest Gallant, who in December of 2019 claimed that they rediscovered this species, claiming it was extinct and now it has been found. And we discuss if Sergio had any say in that or was he part of that process and uh, I'll talk more about that at the end of the podcast because I actually have a lot to say in regards to that but for now let's listen to Sergio tell us the entire story. Well Sergio welcome to the show I really appreciate you taking the time I know you're really crazy busy uh, in in Colombia right now so thank you for being here. Uh, Thank you for having me Dylan and and I, yeah, we were trying to 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 have this this meeting, uh, you know, for a long time. So I'm glad that we finally we finally just found found the time to to, to do it. Yes, yeah, no, it's excellent. And you know, a, a big pillar of my show is promoting conservation. A, a huge segment of the audience are reptile keepers, and I'm constantly trying to push the idea of conservation and get people to start thinking of conservation in a different right way. Even if they own, you know, one animal, they should start looking at maybe the, you know, the natural habitat of where that animal comes from, and, and if there's anything they can do to help that area. And conversations with people like yourself really spark that fire. And so I'm really looking forward to getting into your work, and you have some really fascinating stuff. But before we do that. Let's rewind the clock back to when you were a child growing up. Did you have this passion for animals or do you remember when it kind of started? Well, I can say that I, my, my passion was about science, you know, since I was little. I all the time was looking forward to, to know things, you know, I was really curious. And as I was just growing up, you know, all this passion was just taking a direction for nature. Um, when I just jumped to the to 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 the university to 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 get my bachelor, I did my I, I got my bachelor in marine biology. So I started working on that and I start playing with you know different groups. So I work with with fish, with mammals, with with many groups. And at the end, I just found the target. I just 
you know, I, I, I got into the reptiles and I started looking these weird animals and just love it. So I started saying like, okay, I want to do my science with these animals as my, my roles. So that's, that, that's how everything starts. It's for me living in Canada, it's just so fascinating to, to think of somebody growing up in a country where, you know, there's rainforest is part of the makeup of the country. And I can't imagine what that's like, because for me, the rainforest is like this foreign land. I've been there two times in my life and it's very far and it's almost like a fairy tale in a lot of ways. What is it like growing up in a country where like, do you have access to the rainforest? Can you just go do you, like, was it common to go trip to trips at the rainforest or, or how is that? I was born in, a, in in the mountains. I was born in the in the in the Andes in a city that's called Sogamoso, and it's really high elevation. So we don't have rainforest there. We have other type of forest that they are they are really rich too. But when I I will say that I I was I start like jumping on rainforest maybe when I was in high school. I start traveling, you know, to all these places and um, the, the Chocó region, the Amazon region, and just after, you know, right in the university and after the university, I start just traveling around my, my country. And and yeah, as you say, it's amazing because we have we don't have to move really far to get amazing places you know and, and you can be in the beach and three hours after you can be in the top of the mountain with completely totally different ecosystems and totally different biodiversity around you so it's it's pretty amazing yeah that sounds incredible and i guess as a biologist that's literally like the best thing possible yeah, exactly you you see a lot of stuff and so so ju it's just about your curiosity and what you want to jump on but but you have everything in front of you. <laughs> Was there something specific that pushed you into crocs specifically? In, in Latin America, in Colombia, when you are getting your master with your bachelor's, you need to you, you need to do a, a thesis, like like in like the master thesis. Here we have a bachelor's thesis. So my project was with Crocs. And at the time I I was like at the end, like I, I will say the fourth year of my bachelor's and I went to Costa Rica so working there with some friends uh, I want to I wanted to do my my thesis with snakes but after just working back and forth with some stuff I went I, I came back to Colombia and started working in a park um, and doing some 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 like university work and I saw a lot of crops there American crops. And I started talking with all the biologists and all these these guys that, that were working in the park at that at that time, and I asked them like, you know, what do we know about these these species here? How big is the population? Where they move? You know, and they say they say like, we we know nothing about the species. I said like, mm, well, I, I can do that. I can you know I can help you with that. So I just developed my project around that. So that, that was my, my bachelor's thesis, uh, assessing the population of the American croc in, a, in the, the name is um, Salamanca Road Park. I, I will say that, that that will be the name in English. Um, so I did my, my project there. It was pretty amazing, you know, just working with these guys with crocs all the time, every night. I just start developing the passion. And after that, I just, I started, I co-create, co-founded um, an NGO with some friends. Um, and we started working on a lot of stuff. I, I work with jaguars. I work with uh, cowards, with a lot of species. But all the time, you know, crocs were there, you know, developing small projects, trying to just keep it there as a, as a model of, of research. And... Um, I will say eight years ago, I just found the possibility to go to the States to get my, my PhD. So I went there and, and you know, this, this opportunity just opened a lot of doors. So I started working with different species of crocs around. So yeah, was, was, was the line. 
And and your your PhD work was also on the American croc as well, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did some some the the, the focus of that, of that project was trying to understand the natural history of the American croc in in Coiba Island in in Panama, <clears throat> because we have we have a lot of understanding about these species, like general, but when we try to go to specifics. We we see that we have a lot of you know gaps, so we just try to just fill those gaps with ecological knowledge, <clears throat> trying to cover spatial ecology, uh, <clears throat> traffic ecology, you know all these all these lines, because for me I, I can define myself myself also as a conservation biologist, <clears throat> and for me the the only way to preserve is knowing. You know, knowing the species and knowing the species is not just knowing the the, the shape or uh, you know identify them. It's knowing how they play the role in the ecosystem, and and that's the information that we need to get. It's yeah, it's the really the big picture thing, and it's um, it's amazing how many gaps there are in our scientific literature when you start going to a specific species. It, you know, there's lots of work to be done in a lot of ways, which is a good thing for people that are going into biology now. And exactly. actually, your entire defense is on YouTube, and I watched it. It was, uh, I, I, I think, I don't know if it was on your, your uh, I think if you just search your name, it just shows up on YouTube, and you can kind of watch it. what I assume is a truncated version of your American Croc work for your PhD. And it's amazing yeah. how much, how in depth you can go on, on a single species. Yeah. I mean, so, like yeah, an exactly. area of a single species, even. Exactly, exactly. I think the important part here is <clears throat> trying to get a lot of specifics that so so you can just give that information to the public, to the decision takers, <clears throat> sorry, and they can just, you know, develop all the policy over this information. I, I think that this, you know, you, you can have sound conservation just when you start to, to understand what is going on there. Uh, for me, one is one of the big issues right now about conservation is like people try to see it just just one side of the picture. It's like I love animals, so I just want to protect everything, or I want to use animals, so I just want to use everything. And and now we need to just integrate everything. And and the only way to do that is just you know getting all this information. Uh, understanding the role of the species is not just having American crops there. Is what you know understanding what 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 is the role on the ecosystem? What what happened in the ecosystem when you take this species off? Yeah, exactly. and that's one thing that you know we found over history is when you remove a single species, it has just these super dramatic effects on the on the ecology. Something that a lot of times you wouldn't even predict, and then you you pull them out and go, wow, that all of a sudden the grass stopped growing or something. And w an interesting thing that you in that uh, doctoral defense is you I don't know was it you that had that scoot ID that you developed that I uh, that ability to identify an individual crocs based off of the pattern uh, their, their scoot pattern. Yes, yes, that that was like an aside project because we were doing some capture to do some population analysis, and I I start to I, I start collecting crocs since you know when I did my bachelor's here in Colombia, but at that time in Coiba, <clears throat> I we we had access to a lot of crocs. You know that place has many many American crocs, so I start seeing that that this cutilation. You know the the position of these scutes on the dorsal area of, of these species was really irregular. Was really you know dispersed. Was weird. And I was talking with some researchers, and they say like, well, you know, see, yeah, it's it's variable, but it's not that variable. So I said, well, we we need to just document it. We need to understand how variable that that thing could be. So like one aside project of the PhD was trying to understand the variation of that scutulation. And we found that it is so variable that it that that allow us to identify every single individual in the in the population. It's you know works like a fingerprint. That's amazing. It's, yeah, it, it, it looks yeah. pretty complicated when you look at, I mean, I'm sure if, after you've looked at it en enough times, it becomes simple, but basically you just map out the, the back of the croc and exactly. these the, the scoots don't necessarily, they're always in sort of different spots. 
Exactly. So the, the point is like they they are organized like in term, transversal lines. Mm. So when when you start paying attention, you see that some sometimes those lines they overlap. So supposedly they should have two skew, four skews, but no, they have just three or three or two or just one or none at all. <clears throat> so analyzing those patterns per line, and uh, you you can estimate what is the probability of getting the same pattern in another individual and you after doing all these calculations we found that the probability of repeating those patterns was really 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 low like Mm -hmm. one crack in three thousand um american crocs in the area something like that so after doing all these estimations we could identify all the animals and we can standardize that methodology. Yeah, that's incredibly fascinating. And do you think that will that could translate to other species as well? That same sort of concept. Sure. And right now we are working with some other researchers with some of, uh, with other species. So right now I'm applying the the concept, w- analyzing um, photographs here. So there I had the animal. I captured the animal, took the picture, and analyzed the pattern. But but I knew the animal because I captured it. Right now we are testing the method, just taking pictures, using pictures that people just take when they just go to the beach, for example, and using those pictures to analyze and trying to see, to analyze them and try to see we can identify them like individually. Mm. And results right now, we are we are right now in the process to write the paper, but the the results showing that that yes, you can do it. It's a really effective method. We are doing the same with uh, American alligators, and there, the pattern is more constant. But there still is some variation. We are seeing the process of analyzing um, the data, but but I will say that everything inside of the the crocodilidae family, true crocodiles. Maybe you can you can find that variation in in alligate in alligators and caimans. Maybe it's not that variable. Yeah, that's amazing. That is very fascinating. So so let's talk about the your pa- paper from December. And you may have to help me with the pronunciation, but I, is it the Aparap or the Apaporis River or the, the Rio Apaporis? Apaporis River. Yeah. Apaporis. Okay. Apaporis. Apaporis. So Mm -hmm. this was a really fascinating story. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Apoporus caiman and and, and sort of the history of the animal because it's kind of disappeared a little bit off of the literature. So when you started this project, what what was the what information were you working with? So this project just came out uh, when we we were working at the at the CSG. I'm part of the crocodile specialist group, the IUCN. So we were working with all these guys, all these experts, and they. You know, everyone was asking, like, what's going on with the, the Cayman Apaporis population? Do we know something? And the story behind is, like, in 1955, Medem described this, this weird Cayman with a really pointy cha- a head that was, was completely different to, to what we, at the time, knew about Cayman. So it was really, really pointed. All the time, if you talk like the general model of caimans is like a U-shaped head. But this one was like a V-shaped head, like a cro- like a true crocodile, like an American crocodile. So that's kind of weird. And and based on that and other descriptions, Medem say, say like how this looks different. And at the time, you know, molecular work was unexistent. So based on morphology, he said like uh, this should be something different. And he described it as um, subspecies. And he was the only person working on that until 1980s when he passed away. And after that was like no information. Uh, Colombia, like many people knows, uh, no, these, it's, it's a country with, with um, civil war, like a constant civil war. So we had a lot of guerrillas and, you know, the government fighting with these guerrillas. So, you know, for decades, we had places that we couldn't go because we're so, so dangerous. 
And many biologists, many scientists, have, like suffer, you know, the consequence of of this of the civil war. So, so it was like in a standby. Information about the populations was like inexistent. In the nineties, a, a researcher from the Ministry of Environment, he went the place and he just did a fast expedition. And the information that he collected was just, just create more confusion because for Medem, he was saying like, yes, we have in the, in the Apoporis middle basin, he was sure that there we have Apoporis caimans. And, and he, on, on his book, he said like, uh, you know, everything there is Apoporis caiman. But in the upper river, he describes something like a mix. He said, like, uh, maybe here we have a first caiman and we can, we can have spectacle caiman, the common caiman. So when this guy in Aranco went to in the 90s and he came back, the, the description, he was saying that he saw like 400 animals and like the 80% of those animals were spectacle caimans and just, you know, in a small portion was a Papouris River caimans. So it was like, a, uh-oh, what's mm-hmm. going on? In the, at the beginning of the thousand, in 2000, we tried to, like the CSG tried to go and, and the CSG got some money, but because all these issues about, you know, riots and political unrest, uh, we couldn't. So finally, after the peace agreement, we say like, okay, this is the time we need to go, <laughs> you know, you, we need to know what is going on with these subspecies. And we just meet with some guys, with, with the Crockfest people, get, just gather some guys, collect some money, and just went to the, to the place. So why do you think originally Madame described it as a subspecies of the spectacle came in? Because, it, it, because of the strange morphology, wouldn't the first instinct be that it's a different species entirely? Or like this is from coming from a sort of a layman biologist term, but was, do you think there was a reason for that? I think that he, ah, you know, like the morphology in crocs is not that variable. So if you see, I don't know, bats, you know, in 4 million years, you have the, the, the shape of the school can change from a bat that, you know, is really pointy and long head and, uh, uh, and another species that is completely short and like no, no nose. Mm-hmm. But in crocs, it's more stable. Like, in, like it's, it's, we see that the pattern change, but not that drastically. So when, when Metin saw that, he said, like, uh, something is going on here. But he knew all the species. He, he traveled all, you know, around South America. And he, I, I think that he knew that some um, um, spectacle caimans in the Amazon, maybe in, in the Orinoco area, they had, uh, like, a shape, like, pointy shape uh, head, too. But this American, uh, this Apophoris um, caiman was like really bizarre, you know, like really, really different. So I, I think that that's the reason why he didn't jump to describe a new species. He said like uh, something is going on here. Maybe the isolation that this is, the, the individuals, the population that we have at the Apophoris River is enough to just start creating these differences. However, we need to do more studies to understand if they are completely isolated so we can call this a species or maybe they are still in contact. So I think that that was the, re- the reason why he just described it as a subspecies and not like a species. Mm, that makes sense. And, and he also described the, the unusual color as well, right? In those original yeah. findings. Yeah, they are really yellow in, in, in the Apoporis caiman. They have these, these vermilion dots and they have like orange dots on the neck. Yeah, they, it's weird. <laughs> yeah, it's such a strange. It's, so at the, before you guys went on the expedition, what was the status of it? Was it just like we, we've heard there's records of it where it hasn't been confirmed and it, it wasn't it's extinct or anything. It was just up in the air, basically. Exactly. No, 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 we never, we never 
thought that the species was the subspecies was extinct. We mm -hmm. we we knew that the species it's an spectacle caiman, you know, that that species is so resilient. Uh, you know, that we knew that the species should be there. We didn't knew we didn't know at the time if the species was, you know, threatened or not, because that area is just indigenous communities. So we didn't know if they were using it, you know, how high was the pressure, the pressure. So so we wanted to know, but but the status was like data deficient. We don't know. <laughs> So that's kind of exciting though, hey, you have this kind of blank slate and you're just going on basically a pure adventure at that point. Exactly, exactly. And and to get to the place is really difficult. So so yeah, it's it, that was a journey for sure. So tell me about the expedition. So how how did you guys get there and how long were you out in the field and kind of what type of work were you were you doing out there? So the first the first trip that was in December 2018. We, I, so I'm living right now in Ivage, that is right in the middle of the country. So I took a bus to Bogota. There I took a flight to Me Too, that the department is called Vaupes, that that is just top, like up, uh, upper Amazon. And there I pay a charter that, and that charter re literally just take you from Me Too and drop you in the middle of the forest, <laughs> right, right in the Apaporis River, and they just they they just fly away. They they just leave you. That is such a Latin American thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> like I, so, I, when I, I went to Costa Rica, and it was kind of the same thing. Like you just travel into these areas, and it's just like there they go, and you're like, uh, can I get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the, so I just we just landed there. And, and the pilot said, like, okay, when do you want me to go back for you? It's like, a, in one week. Okay, see you in one week. And <laughs> he flew away. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So once you were there, uh, what's the next step? So you're in this uh, kind of very remote place. I guess you set up camp. And then how do you start looking for, for these Cayman? So the, the first thing was approaching to the communities, you know, because that that is a indigenous territory. So I start talking with all the people that lead the area. So I, I interview the, the community. I ask them about how they use it. I ask them about the places that made them describe in the book. Because one, one interesting thing is like made them describe three lagoons but I was, you know, asking everyone here and no one knew at the time where the In and Out Lagoon was. So so it was like at the beginning was asking everyone, trying to just get these places correct. And after that, well, I started working with them. They took me to the places. We did some spotlights. We started seeing animals. After we start capturing animals, collecting samples, and that's it. That that was a week. <laughs> How exciting was that first specimen that you caught? Oh, that was that was pretty neat, man. Because we we captured a big animal. The, the first one was a big animal. Uh, I think that was was like meter and a half, something like that. And on on, on that size, you can see the the pointy shape right away. When, when the animal is small, it's not that clear. But when they are larger, they it is really clear. So I capture it, and I saw it's like, a, wow, this, this looks like an American frog, you know, really, really pointy. Completely different to the spectacle caiman that I'm used to, to work here in, 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 in the Andes. So, so it was really interesting. It was really excited, you know. Uh, I, I've been re reading Medem for 20 years and, and it feels good to just go back to the place where he described his subspecies and, and he was all the time talking about this area. So it was, was really cool. Yeah, that's the part that I found the most fascinating was that you can take this work that was done in 1955 and then you have this basically 60 year gap and then you can go back to those areas and there they are. They're still there. 
Exactly, exactly. As, as I was telling you, I, we, we never thought that the species was extinct. Mm -hmm. We wanted to know what, what was the status because that was an endemic subspecies, you know? So we, we need to protect it. We need to protect it. So, so that, that was the main thing. But, but yeah, we, we never thought that there was extinct. Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll, we're going to get into that because I'm curious about that as well. And in terms of the the, morpho the the morphology of the jaw as well as the color, do you, have, do you have any speculation on sort of the environmental pressures or the evolutionary pressures that, that had such a drastic deviation from a, a normal spectacle caiman? We are still working on it. And um, we did all the molecular work right now. Uh, that, so the paper was submitted already. It's, it's right now under review. And the results, the genetic results using mitochondrion, uh, just say that the Apoporis caiman is so close to the normal spectacle caiman from the Amazon and the Orinoco places. So caiman crocodilus crocodilus and caiman crocodilus apoporiensis are kind of the same. That's so, incredible. Yeah. So we just found so that the genetics revealed that that thing that we were calling a subspecies maybe is just an ecotype. Wow. You know, some, something that beca because the, the, envir the environmental pressure that they have in the area, we don't know exactly what just cut, you know, was the reason for that, but because the, the, the environment, they, they just, you know, that, that shape, pointy shape was just selected in favor. And, and we have this like morphotype, different morphotype from from everyone else, from every, every everywhere else. But um, genetically, looks like they are the same. I guess you could think about even when you look at breeds of dogs, right? Morphology wise, they're totally different, and you could take their DNA and they would be virtually identical. It's, exactly. it's pretty interesting. And I know that you also mentioned in the in the paper that there was. A potential specimen of the Apoporus came in, in at a, I think a zoo in Cincinnati. Was that? Could you ever confirm that, or was that just kind of a, a rumor? It's just like so. My advisor at, at Texas Tech, when at the time that he was doing his PhD dissertation, um, he collects some samples from crocs around the, the states. He was the first person just to build. Um, the, the phylogeny of these crocs. Um, and he got, when, when we started working with this Apaporis Cameron and, and I showed him some pictures, he, he all the time was telling me like, you know, that animal from Cincinnati was something like, the, like what you are showing me right now. So we start digging up, like trying to ask, but at that time in the States, you know, the, the, the documents of the process of the, all these animals was not like that organized like right now. So we don't know for sure from where that animal, where the animal come from, but we knew that that shapey, that the shape of the head just match it with something from the Orinoco, Amazon, Colombian area. So, yeah, so we just, uh, and, and the result, the genetic result that you did at the time, just point this animal like something different to everything else. Got it. So that's why we were thinking that that was an Apoporis caiman, but we don't, we are not certain about that. So at the end of the day, after, did you go, was it two expeditions you went down or did you just go once? No, I went four times. Oh, four times. So at the mm -hmm. end, how many sp uh, specimens was it total that you found? Well, individuals, uh, in the first count in December, we got like 100 over 100. In the second one, we got like a similar number. In April, we got like, now, in, the, in April, we got more animals, like around 200. And in June, we got nothing because, you know, the, the Amazon just completely float on that area. So we saw no animal there. 
And we went back in November and around 100, 150, something like that. Right now I'm analyzing that, that, that data to do some uh, population ecology analysis and used to submit that paper too. But, but the population is not threatened at all. So we have, we know that people use it, like, you know, every indigenous culture use the biodiversity that they have around, but they don't use it in a unsustainable way. It's just some, some small uh, communities use it. Many of them don't like to use it. They have a lot of uh, beliefs about these species. They think that, um, Apopori is a caiman, it's kind of a condemnment, so they don't eat it. Yeah, that's what I, I really found that fascinating. So the people around that area actually have some folklore with it. So they actually see it as, do they see it as a, a man that was didn't live well in, in his regular life and he's come back as as, like a, as a punishment, basically, as this Apopori's caiman? No, the, 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 the story behind is, is, is really, it's pretty. It's, they say that um, like the, what will be the, the grandfather of all these communities, that, that that person was there outside walking in the river and he found a lady, naked lady on the river, like injured. So he took the lady to his house and tried to cure this, this, this lady. He has a helper a young guy that was learning everything about nature. And this uh, guy, this, the old man told him like, please don't get close to this lady, respect this lady. But this young, young guy was walking back and forth and seeing this, this naked lady, he was just, you know, curious about her. So he, he got close, he tried to intimate with her and the story says that many, a lot of bugs came out of the lady and eat all the guts of the young guy. Wow. So when the elder came to the room, he said like, oh, what did you do, man? And he tried to save him. So he took some uh, leaves from palms. And with that, he just saw, you know, the stomach of this young guy and just put it in the water. And that was the first Apoporis Cayman. Wow. That is <laughs> that is such a like a detailed story. That that really shows the how much information you can get from the indigenous people of that area, oh, yeah. right? That's yeah, incredible. and they are really close. They are really close with all these all these um species. That's why you need to work close with them, you know, because we, we are not from there. Mm -hmm. We know nothing over there. Well, we know science, but they have the knowledge about the their surroundings, so it, it's like you know, it's, it's like a fool acting like a fool. You just, just go there and try to to think that you know everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to access that or tap into that knowledge of the and it's deep knowledge that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, right? That's it's exactly. Been there. And I exactly. know that they actually eat other species of caiman, but they seem to stick away. They stay away from the Apoporus caiman. Yeah, they love uh, eating palisucus, but the apopodes, they don't like it. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's very, very cool. So, of course, many people have heard of the apopodes came in through Animal Planet's thing last year where uh, Forrest Gallant, you know, it's an extinct or live show that they found him, uh, found an apopodes came in and found out that it wasn't extinct. And, I, I you know, it was one of those... I think media things, and I, I really wanted to know because you were on the team, and it's your paper that dis that rediscovered the species, even though, like you said, it was never classified as extinct. Did you have any say in that Animal Planet thing at all, or did they contact you, or how how did that work? Well, when we did the the crop fest uh, in the states, a uh, forest just emailed us and tried to 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 contact, you know, to try to to offer like his help to do this expedition. So we start talking, you know, we, we, were, we are really open to. So we were start talking and 
Is this before the first expedition? This deal was before, yeah. Was was right after the Croc Fest. So we started talking with him, you know, email back and forth. And the idea was like uh, we were planning to go uh, to together to the place, to 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 the Apaporis River. But after a couple conversations, I just saw that he so so I told him, like, you know. If you want to go, we are going to do research. You can film, but we are doing the research. So he said, "Yes, yeah, let's do that." I, you know, I'm a biologist too, so so we can do that. And we had a meeting, and I, well, I, I was open, I, I and I gave all the the information. So like, uh, you know, to get to this place, like like I described it to you, you need to take. A fly from here to there, or you can go from here to there. Uh, you guys can contact this company, and that company can help you out. You know, with, uh, arranging everything for your trip. Um, and that's it. After that, well, I just saw that he was just not trying to to help the research, but he was just wanted. To, he just wanted to do the show. So say like, uh, man, I I am not a TV guy. That's not my thing. I am a researcher, and I just want to continue doing research. And and he's and they just disappear. We just you know stop stop talking. I went in December, and and I went back in January. And when I went back in January, I the community told me that that a crew from the, the states just came to to that area. And pay a lot of money to to just go to the place and and get some animals. And I said, like, okay, you know, I don't have an issue of that. You know, no no one owns crocs, mm-hmm. and and just just I hope that he has all the permits because that that would be a violation. <laughs> right, right, yeah. But but yeah, but if he wants to work with crocs too, you know, go ahead. That, that's better for the species. So. So he went after you went the initial time, and so it was kind of between your first and second trip, basically. I I think so. Yeah, I went in December. I, I remember there was like the second week of December, and I went back in January, the second week of January. And when I went there, the community told me that the week before, I will say maybe I I, I don't know the exactly the exact date when he went but i will say that was yeah right in the middle maybe or maybe the the week before i went in january something like that so obviously no biologist goes into biology to become famous and and and, you know you you don't want to be like you said you're not a tv person you're not interested in being on animal planet and whatnot but it, it from an outsider's perspective it does seem a little bit frustrating that someone like yourself who did all the work you've been doing this for years reading uh, all, all the you know madame's work and everything and then that show kind of comes out and, and even sort of paints it in a picture as if it was maybe extinct and rediscovered in a way how do you feel about it being you know part of that picture well yeah yeah that was not that was not cool at all but as, as, as I told you, and I, I was I was talking with another journalist, and he did a publication about about this topic. I don't know if you ever read it. Uh, I don't remember the, the name of the Andrew Andrew Wright. He mm, he he wrote so. something. He wrote something about this. Like he 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 was he was writing about parachute science. So all these guys that come from the first world and go to the third say that I want to help and they just got the data and went out and publish and say nothing about the people, you know, from the, the country. Um, and I think that that is the, that is the bad part here. No one owns species, you know, so if you want to work with crocs, you can do it, but you, you need to give the rights and give the credits to, to the people that deserve it. You, you know, it's impossible being from the middle of California, knowing everything about how to go to the Apopores, is that you got that knowledge from somewhere or somehow or someone. So I think that the point here is like, 
we need to be ethical in the way that we work. Um, it's not about who did it first. It's about how you did, you know, how, how you work. And I think that that's the difference between people that do science and people that just want to use science to be famous. Yes. Yeah, it is definitely, yeah, it, like you said, we, no one owns the world. We all, as a, as a scientific community, everybody wants to help everybody because everybody benefits when more discoveries are made and more information is added to that, you know, the knowledge base. But that parachute science is a really interesting term. I've never heard that term before. And that's sort of exactly what it seems like. It just sort of popped in and, and took the credit for it. And yeah, uh, I will send to you the link. I, it's a really nice article. Yeah, I, I would definitely like to read that because it's, yeah, it's a little bit weird. And I mean, I've, I've seen a few of his interviews on, on Rogan and yeah, he's, a, he's a, um, a, a TV guy, like he's a host, that's his job. And it would have been nice to at least throw credit to the people who, who helped him get exactly. there. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, you know, everyone fits in one type of job and I, maybe this one fits for, for him really well, but the point is like, you don't need to, you don't need to try to take all the credit for yourself because people, people, you know, people, they are not idiots. They, they know that you can do everything by yourself. That's impossible. You need help and doesn't hurt. You know, saying like, thank you to these and these and these and these and these guys that help me out to get to the place. That's just being polite. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I totally agree. So anyway, that was a little bit disappointing to see. But like you are the person that I want to highlight because the, the, the story is so fascinating. And in terms of future studies, can you and obviously you've you have practice doing like really, really in-depth studies with other species. Is that something that you're going to do with the Apropos came and moving forward? Yes, yes, we we are still doing analyzing data. So right now it's that paper that was published in, uh, published last, last year about the expedition. Uh, right now we submitted the paper about the molecular part. That that paper was focused trying to understand like like the phylogenetics and phylogeographics of this. Uh, so we just air found that. Um, Apoporis caiman is not like a subspecies, genetically speaking. It's just more like part of the caiman crocodilus spectrum. So right now, we, we are done with that. The next step is trying to understand why we have that morphotype there that is really different and, and trying to understand the uniqueness of the morphotype. So I am working with some other researchers trying to go to other places in Colombia that no information it's available to analyze the shape of the head. So we are taking pictures and analyzing, doing some uh, geometric morphometrics, trying to see if there is like a gradient, gradient on on the shape of the head, like other authors has pointed out, or or for real that pointed shape is just from the apoporis area. So we are going back to the Apoporis area and going to the Guainia department and going to the Orinoco area to capture animals, take pictures and continue with this research because that's really interesting. We, we want to know why it, these animals it, have this, this shape and how unique it is. And I guess one thing that I don't think we mentioned in that area, there was, you did not find any specimens of like the typical caiman crocodilus crocodilus or the spectacled caiman. That's right. Well, something that we are working right now on, it's like we think that this big change is ontogenic. That means that when they, are ha when they hatch, we found some nests and we took some, me took, took some measurements. And when they hatch, the 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 proportion of the head, the, the measurements on the head are really, really similar to a normal spectacle caiman. But as they grow up, the head start point, like taking that, that pointy shape. And right now, like with these um, like preliminary results, we, we found that animals with a head over five centimeters will start showing that clearly that pattern, that pointy shape 
a head that Medin described. But animals with a head smaller than 10 centimeters, the, the total length of the head, um, it's more like in the gray area. It's difficult to, to separate it from the common spectacle caiman. And I think that's, that's my, my hypothesis. That's why these researchers in the 90s found so many uh, uh, spectacle caimans because, uh, you know, in, generally when you are out trying to catch um, crocs, you see the, the small ones. The larger ones are, are really scaring and, and they just hide up really well. So maybe that could explain why he was reporting that. But, but for now, we need to really uh, test if this is antigenic or not. So we are in the process too. How, how, do you, how would you test for that? It, what's the process of that? Or is that too complex of a question? No, no, no. It's, it's, well, it's just taking animals, you know, and start measuring, taking pictures of the head as they start, uh, as they grow up and analyzing the proportions, the relation of the length of the head, the, the, the width of the head and analyzing how those relations compare with like a common spectacle camera. Got it. So, so that, that will take time because we need to take some animals and, you know, start that they grow up and take pictures every month. But, but that will allow us to understand what's going on. So if, if for sure it, it's, differ, it's different since they, are ha they hatch or when they hatch, you know, it's kind of the same. And after they grow up, they head change. So interesting. So is, is this may be too general of a prediction as well, but is skull morphology typically related to prey? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, it's, it's you know, prey influence a lot. And, and it's a lot of papers on crocs about that, like how long rostering or brevi rostering uh, heads a uh, can be explained by what they eat. So all these animals that they are very, very rostering, so the, the head is more um, short, um, they in generally eat things that they are more uh, hard to break. And these animals that have, they, they have the, a very rostering head, more a longer head, they generally eat things that are more fast and more easy to more more fleshy mm. so like for example garials that they just eat fish things like that yeah it, it's, it's like a gener general pattern so the thing is trying to understand here how this characteristic is favoring you know in this habitat and why it was selected for very interesting. It's such a bizarre creature. And in terms of the color, is there anything in the environment that gives you an idea of where, where that color may have developed through? Is the river a certain color? Like is the mud or something different? Yeah, we think that this is because the minerals that the river has. Those rivers are full of minerals. Those rivers are full of gold. <laughs> so, so we think that is because the composition of the river uh, that these animals just develop that uh, like variation in color. So th they are still green, but they look yellow, like more yellow than the, the normal spectacle caiman. Is it, is it there are scales that are getting stained or, or are they actually eventually kind of as they mature, there's, their scalation sort of goes into that yellow or that's still up in the air? That's up in the air. We, we need to start looking into it. But I will say that that is just because what they eat. So they will start accumulating minerals. And the first place where we accumulate those minerals are, you know, all these um, osteological structures. And, and, you know, you can see that pretty well on, on the osteoderms. Right. That makes sense.
Now, so we'll start wrapping up here. In terms of kind of moving away from that, I was curious about your opinion on the private sector keeping crocodilians in general, because this seems to be coming, I don't know if it's more popular, but I see it often. And I always wonder, like, a lot of times these are really big animals and they're very aggressive animals and a lot of people shouldn't keep them. But from, from your point of view, what do you think about that? Well, I think, that the, the, you know, if, if people want to keep animals, I think that is fine, but we need to educate them in order to avoid issues. So if you are keeping an animal, it's because you love the, those species, because you wanted to have it and see it every day. So that means that you, you take care of the species, but also the meaning of that species, you know, what the crocodile represents. And the, the, the issue here is like, because it's, it's trendy. So, you know, everyone is getting a, a croc in Christmas, and next Christmas, yeah, the cro the crack is too big, so they just throw it in the sewer. Mm -hmm. And you, we know that that has, you know, terrible. Um, it is re is really bad for for ecosystems. If you do that in New York, well, the animal will die in winter. But if you do that in Florida, well, that's why we have there right now pythons, and we have a Cayman, spectacle caimans and we have wharf caimans and we have a lot of stuff there that should not be there and it's because the trade so i think that is you know the trade is not the problem the problem is that people are not educated enough to care about what they are doing uh, i think that just the, the point is just trying to just dig more and put more pressure on education in this topic. Yeah, that makes sense. And there's there's also some really good private keepers that are doing some really cool conservation work as well with some captive breeding and whatnot. And it is, uh, it is, you're right, it is kind of a trendy thing. And one thing is these typically these animals have an incredibly long lifespan, like ridiculously long. So mm -hmm. if you're getting it as a pet, you have to kind of plan for that. I don't know, like exactly. 40, 50 years or more. Exactly, exactly. So, so if you're into it and you know that you can do it and you will just offer the conditions to have the animal, you know, in, in, in really in good conditions and you will not just get rid of the animal the first time that the animal do something, well, you are a good person to keep an animal, you know. That, so, so I think that the, the problem is not... I, so I, I don't think that the regulation is is the issue right now the issue is education we need to we need to educate the community so they they are more responsible with yep. with what they have i completely agree i think that is a that is a great way to wrap up so sergio thank you very much this is a fascinating story i know people will find this totally amazing because it's, it's just one of those things that's an adventure and a mystery at the same time so i'm super look, uh, looking forward to your future work as well with the apoporus came in and, and whatever else you end up doing is there a place where you can send people to just kind of find your stay up to date with what what you're up to uh well thirdly thank you thank you for the invitation man i i, I really had a really good time talking with you yes we i have the 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 webpage of my lab, the U University of Ivage. So if you just type Balaguer in a lab in, in Google, you will find it. And there right now is not really updated, but I will update it, uh, update the, the webpage. And there you can find all the research that we are doing in the lab and the projects, future projects. Um, yeah, so just if you just want to know what I'm doing, you just you go to the web page awesome all right well thank you very much sergio this was a pleasure thank you the all right that is the end of that episode sergio thank you so much for giving me an hour of your time you are up to some seriously fascinating work i know the listeners will have enjoyed that conversation as well i will eagerly be waiting for your next publication to come out and for the listeners everything we discussed in the episode will be in the show notes i highly recommend going to read that article that sergio mentioned on parachute science written by andrew white really really fascinating i'm going to talk about that more in a second as well and then i do have links to sergio's lab as well as the youtube link to his doctoral defense on the american crocodile which was really fascinating as well so definitely go check those out 
so I did want to take a couple of minutes and discuss this extinct or alive Sega that we that Sergio mentioned in the episode. And I, I want to take it kind of at a broader context. One of the things we hear all the time in our culture is that we are in the age of information. You constantly hear that. It's the information age. And personally, I don't think that's true at all. Although we do have access to ample and essentially infinite amounts of information, we aren't in the age of information. We are in the age of entertainment. And this story that Sergio has told us today in this podcast exemplifies that absolutely perfectly. As a general rule, our culture seems to gravitate towards more of an entertainment stimulus rather than an informative stimulus. And it's something that I bump up against all the time with the podcast because I'm trying to provide information to people or at least trying to highlight people who are incredibly brilliant and letting them talk and tell their story about the research that they've done or the work that they've done with certain animals. And of course, on YouTube, YouTube is an entertainment platform. The videos that do really well, the ones that spike through the ceiling in terms of the analytics, are videos that are just pure sensationalism and entertainment. Not always, but a lot of the time. And a lot of times, it's actually not even, those types of videos are not providing good information, and sometimes it's even detrimental information. We talked about that last week, about the pet tubers making these entertainment videos or entertaining videos, but often providing poor care advice for the animals. So it's this very strange moment in time where wow factor is way more important than true, honest, authentic information. And from my point of view, I am just waiting for that entertainment bubble to burst. I think at some point, the general population is going to get tired of the Hollywood glitz and glam, explosions, green screens, and they're just going to get sick of being lied to. And that's exactly what Sergio's story shows. Animal Planet, Discovery Channel, these were the two channels that were what we all grew up on as just being really good, true, authentic information, and they just produced a show that was a complete lie. And of course, most people who are watching Extinct or Alive are not going to have a background in Cayman information, so they're just going to assume what they're watching is true, because why wouldn't you? If they told you at the beginning of the show that this was acting, that this was just entertainment, that would be a different story. But they're painting it on Animal Planet and Discovery Channel as if this was real science. And and that is just incredibly annoying. You know, and I don't think Forrest is a bad guy. My guess is this is a person who has a deep passion for animals that is that has led his life has led him down a path where he's now the host of a television show. And once you become the host of a television show on a giant network, you are compelled by that giant network to do basically whatever it is they want you to do to make sure the show sells. So in a lot of ways, it's not like this is just on forest. It's just on society as a whole, placing more value on entertainment than information. You know, they call Forrest a biologist, but he has a bachelor degree in biology. I have a bachelor degree in anthropology, and I don't call myself an anthropologist. Of course, I'm not going out and doing anthropological work, but Forrest isn't either. He's, he again, the host of a television show. So they, they paint this as if this is an extinct caiman. They show Forrest, uh, Forrest diving into this river, tackling this, this caiman, collecting him, and talking about it as if he's the first person to ever lay eyes on this, even though we know Sergio and his team had done it a month before. Then they take a tissue sample by cutting off a piece of scale on the tail, claiming that this is the you know super rare DNA that's going to make a total difference. And at first, I assumed that that probably just went right into the garbage, because like Sergio said, they're not going out to do research, they're going out to make a show. But if you go read the article in Undark by Andrew White, he, he breaks down that parachute science. And according to Forrest's team, they did actually go ahead and do some genetic testing on that tissue sample. Of course, it's not going to go anywhere. And even in a more laughable sense, it says in the article, again, this is the article on Undark by Andrew White, it says the press release also said Gallant is working on a scientific paper that would allow the Rio Apropos Cayman to be classified as its own species. Now that statement is absolutely laughable because if you listen to the conversation I had with Sergio, he said genetically the common spectacled caiman and the Rio Apropos caiman are genetically the same. The, the, the metaphor I use is you took the DNA from a husky and the DNA from a chihuahua, even though they look very different species wise, they are the same. So if Forrest and the extinct or live animal planet team actually did the genetic work, they would never have said to be classified as its own species. So either they didn't do the actual genetic testing or when they got the results back, they didn't look at it or when they got the results back, they didn't understand how to interpret it. So again, it just sort of pumps this sort of facade as if they are doing scientific work when they are just not. 
Now, in Forrest's defense, they actually don't include the Rio Apoporos Cayman in one of his famous discoveries on his website. They do include the Zanzibar leopard, which I don't think has been confirmed, and the Fernadina Galapagos tortoise, which if you read the Undark article, you'll be disappointed or not surprised to find that he actually wasn't the one to find it. So I think they have started to recoil a little bit on this whole Rio Apoporos Cayman issue because probably they received a ton of backlash from the scientific community. However, for Forrest to go on Joe Rogan, the biggest podcast in the world, and to essentially lie, but he does say, he mentioned Sergio's name, but he says him and Sergio found it within a month of each other. And he specifically uses that phrase because he doesn't want to say that Sergio found it first. Again, it's not about who found it first. It's about giving credit to the team that helped him get there. And Sergio and his team helped him get there. It's not about the biologists don't need a medal, a gold medal for saying you're the first person to find the species. But to just go on the largest podcast in the world and, and make the claim that it was you and your team that did it is just a lie. And then in an even more egregious statement, shortly after Forrest makes the claim that him and Sergio found the Cayman within a month of each other, he goes, hey, I'm just a hide and seek guy. I go out into the world and I find these animals. And now there's this really amazing Colombian biologist named Sergio who gets to work with the species and manage its existence. I cannot think of a more patronizing statement. Now, I have to make this very, very clear. I am not speaking for Sergio. I'm speaking for myself. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as an outsider looking in on this, and this is the way I feel about it. I'm watching Forrest basically say, hey, we did all the legwork for you, and now, Sergio, here's the consolation prize. You get to study the animal that uh, we found for you. When we know that Sergio and his team gave Forrest the information for how to find the caiman in the wild. So from my point of view as a consumer of information, it's just disappointing, especially coming from Discovery Channel, which I grew up on. And I'm sure you did as well watching documentaries. I, we should go back to the documentary days. We don't need people tackling animals in the bush to, to make us feel excited. At least I don't. So anyway, I think that's the end of my rant. I know Sergio is such a humble person and he just continues to plot away at his actual scientific work that is truly fascinating. And that's really what I wanted to highlight in this episode. I wanted to hear the story from him to understand what it was like to go into that area and find that first Apoporus Cayman, what research is being done. And I was just completely amazed to find out that the Apoporus Cayman and common spectacle Cayman genetically are almost identical, which was something that I would never have guessed. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you are interested in any more information, definitely go check out the show notes. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Affiliate links are in the YouTube description as well as on the show notes. And you can head to AnimalsAtHome.ca slash shop to pick yourself up a sweater or a shirt. And $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. I will talk to you guys next week.